Hello, my name is Jack Barrich, and this is Ocean Solutions, a podcast produced by Altasea at the Port of Los Angeles. Altasea is developing the most innovative ocean research campus in the world, a place where scientists, educators, and business people can work together on solving some of the world's most pressing problems, including climate change, energy supply, and global food security. On today's show are Regina Wetzer and Dean Pencheff, scientists from the LA Museum of Natural History. Regina and Dean will be on a museum team that is hosting a marine bio blitz from August 19th to September 2nd at Altasea at the Port of Los Angeles. The bio blitz will focus on the marine biodiversity in the urban waters of Los Angeles. Really great stuff. Hope you enjoy this show. So, the LA Museum of Natural History will be leading this thing called a Marine Bio Blitz at Altasea. For the uninitiated, like me, what is a bio blitz? Well, generally it's, it's used when you get a bunch of people together to really intensively study the biology, the biodiversity of a single small area, all at once. So rather than the way we usually study things is people go out and sample things slowly over time, you do this in a very intensive manner. A whole bunch of people, very often one day. Right. They just come in and that's why, hence the word blitz. They just come in and they just blitz it. Just everybody comes in and it's it's a full-on D-Day of science. Exactly. Get everything you can in a short amount of time. Right. And so, but in this particular time, uh, uh, after you're going to be going for two weeks. Yeah. Um, and your focus will be on uh, the marine biodiversity in the urban waters of Los Angeles. What are you hoping to accomplish over the two-week period that you're uh, doing this bio blitz? So the project we're working with, and the reason we're doing this uh, project, it's a project called DISCO, which stands mm -hmm. for Diversity Initiative for the Southern California Ocean. And that project is dedicated to really unfolding the biodiversity that's right on the coast, right here, on, off the, the Los Angeles coastline, um, in the marine environment. Um, and when we say biodiversity, we're really talking about biodiversity in a very, very general sense. Biodiversity, we usually think of as the diversity of species at a spot. That's mm -hmm. kind of, it turns out, a middle-level way of thinking of biodiversity because there's also diversity among communities of species. So this, the community of species here off the PV Peninsula is very different than the whole community off of Santa Cruz, which is very different than the community off um, the, uh, the uh, Channel Islands. So there's diversity between communities as well. There's diversity within spe between Can species. Can you give an example of what you mean by that? Like, what would be the difference between one community uh, off one set of waters versus a community in, so in another? Like, very simple, if you don't mind. Probably the simplest way would be to think about um, underwater video you've seen taken off the coast here mm -hmm. and compare that in your mind to what you've seen on a coral reef. Right. They're Got both it. underwater, but right. they're really different. Right. right. And one, they may have the same number of species in each right. one. But they're really different right. species. So right. there's makes... differences between communities. Sure. But then there can be two communities sitting right next to each other, one of which has 75 species, the other one of which has five species. Right. So those have a different biodiversity at that level. Mm -hmm. There's also diversity within species. So when you're studying community, are there certain common traits that you're looking for? And if you are, why, why is that important? What we're trying to do is develop the technology to allow us to assess who is in the community. That's right. the most basic way that, that we have to, to begin answering the question. Right. The first thing we need to do is inventory who's there. Right. Once we can tell who's there, we can start looking at the characteristics of what species and how many of each species are present in place after place after place and look at what are the key indicators of health of ecological right. health. Right. There are places that are healthier than others, places sure. where the biology is working better for all the organisms, including us. Right. Um, and there are places that are more impacted and not doing so well. Right. Um, those are reflected in differences in the species that are there, differences in the communities. So from what I understand, you mentioned the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Um, you're going to be, are you going to be out in open water and then also like in port water, which as you mentioned, in, in, or I mentioned is, uh, urban water, or is, is it both? We're going to be doing both. Uh, this is going to be an opportuni opportunistic sampling regime, so we're expecting to be uh, collecting samples and surveying on the backside of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. We'll be doing work within the port. Um, again, our uh, 
companions that are working on this whole project, it's, we're leaving it open because so much of it is, has not been studied before. Right. It hardly matters where we start. Right. Everything Just is gotta good. Just got to do something. Got to do something. And again, coming back to how Dean is describing it, we can look at a small community like our little town of San Pedro and the community and the interactions that we have with the people that live here, which right. would be different if we picked a community in San Diego or in Ohio. Right. And so just the same way, there are different interactions, uh -huh. but as museum scientists and based on our training in systematics, the study of how organisms are related, the identification of organisms, the naming of species of organisms. We're working on the most basic component of inventorying who is there, right. such that we can work with colleagues who are ecologists and that can do the synthesis of like how these organisms are interacting. Got it. What are the physical interactions that are happening with the biological ones that make the system work? well, not so well, how do right. you evaluate Why does it work that? well? Why does it not work well? What are Correct. the factors? Do you, got, do you think that when they're studying this, there, there will be some comparison and contrast versus a system that's right in the port versus something that's just a couple miles around the, uh, around the breakwater, out in open water, and then we can sort of, sort of see what a port's effect is on, on the ocean? You bet. That's, that's one of the key interesting questions for this area and right. what makes working in an urban area uh, so amazingly exciting is we know we have areas that are strongly managed. Um, they are impacted by humans. They're also strongly managed to try to benefit biodiversity as much as possible. Sure. Uh, but the inside of the port here is going to be different than the waters just, you know, half a mile away, a mile away, two miles away. And being able to detect that, being able to measure that and see what those effects are, that's really going to be important for our ability to manage. Um, the biology in the port and the and the biology along the coast. Yeah, it's interesting because I can recall when Altice was first being hashed up as an idea, somewhere I, Dr. Geraldine Natz, who was at the time the executive director of the port, she mentioned something that I thought was very interesting that a lot of times this type of scientific research is done in places where the water is really super pristine. And then you get, like, of course, one sampling that is completely different than from something that you'd get in urban waters where, you know, us humans, you know, put our impacts on it. So you're a marine biologist and you've got a research project. Wouldn't you rather be doing it in some remote, beautiful, pristine place? <laughs> it's, it's a human endeavor. Yeah, uh, we, sure. we, uh, put, on your, put on your big yeah. floppy hat and some sunscreen and go enjoy that island. It's not so bad, but we live here. <laughs> right. Studying here is vitally important. So. But all that said, even within the port and from the small amounts of data that we have collected with a variety of techniques, there are all kinds of sub-communities that are very distinct, uh, where diversity is very different from one place. Near the mouth, the opening, where you have much more water exchange than at the back of a channel, or an area that's been recently dredged, or a place where sea grasses or kelps have been planted as a restoration project. You know, I had asked uh, you do this in a previous show, but I'll ask you again, why is this so important? Like, why, why is it that... Um, um, we need to understand how these e ecosystems work, what the uh, di biodiversity is. Um, sometimes when you're, when you're not really playing, paying close attention, it almost seems to the uninitiated frivolous, and it's obviously not frivolous at all. But why isn't it? What is it that's important about the work that you guys are doing to mankind, not just to the little fish that swim under the sea? So one of the ways of thinking about that is that Humans now run the planet. The world is our garden. Right. And like a garden, we get to choose how it will be. In a home garden, it's pretty straightforward how you do that. You plant what you plant, and you water when you water, and you run your garden the way you want it to be. Right. It's a little less obvious how to do that for the rest of the world. Right. But that's our job now. Right. Um, that's the job we have chosen to take on by virtue of wanting to survive. Um, in your home garden, you can look to see what plants are doing well, what plants are not doing well, and choose what, which ones you want to uh, encourage and which ones you don't. Right. In the ocean, we have a really slow, difficult, and very expensive set of technologies for looking at what's growing. Right. Uh, whether it's something that we're growing there ourselves deliberately or just trying to figure out what's growing and how we're affecting it. Right. So we very strongly know that it's going to be incredibly important to develop technologies that allow us to survey who is where in the ocean very quickly, very cheaply, and in very, with very um, broad spatial scale. So that's the technology we're developing, and it's a technology called environmental DNA. 
um, and it allows us to take a sample of seawater, for example, just right. a cup full of seawater, because every organism sheds DNA into the seawater, just the same way we do here on land. We can take a cup of seawater, analyze the DNA that has been shed by the organisms near where we sample that cup, and get an inventory of all of the unique genetic sequences in that cup. We can do that quite cheaply and quite quickly today. What that lets us to do, do is, if you heard me say the result is all of the unique genetic sequences, it would be really nice if we had a database where we could look up every one of those sequences to tell you what that species is. Right. right? So those are the two parts of the puzzle of this new technology, is the ability to sequence the DNA from the ocean water and the ability to look it up in a database. So I look it up in the database and I notice that uh, uh, that something that I thought should be there isn't there. And then you, uh, over repeated times you keep looking and lo and behold it's not there. Why is that important? Why is it important to, you know, how does that work? Again, back to me, you know, Joe Sixpack, who just was living my life without really thinking too much about the ocean, especially if I live in Iowa or somewhere where there's not even an ocean to, to see. What does this mean for me? But you're going to kick back. You're going to have your six pack and the world's going by. <laughs> right. We're breathing the air. We're going to go to the fridge and we're going to take out some food. We're going to make a barbecue. We're going to, the things are readily available. Right. When I think about uh, folks that work on trying to get us to another planet to say to Mars, we would need to know exactly what all the pieces are that we need to take to survive there. Because there's not a fridge, and right. there's not going to be a barbecue, and all of that. Right. So knowing what is here, what those resources are that you know make our homes, let us commute back and forth to work, give us pleasure, um, let our uh, future generations have a good life, all of that is necessary because we are part of the biological world. Most of our bodies are... Not even our own cells, but those of microbes. We're an integral piece of the fabric, and it's all complicated and interconnected. And understanding what those connections are is going to be vital as the world is changing. Uh, and those connections are vital because if something is lacking, that ultimately, if the ocean loses some of its health, we have uh, less food maybe that can come out of it. Um, it's the airplane model. You right. can lose a rivet and the plane keeps flying. Right. And you can lose another one and the plane keeps flying. At some point, there's going to be one last rivet. Right. One of those connections is going to fail and the system collapses. Right. The plane will fall from right. the sky. And you guys, have, how long have you guys been doing this? <laughs> Our whole lives. So we won't give you ages, but uh, <laughs> thank uh, yeah. you. Yeah, we're yeah. both yeah. Full, full career marine biologists. So, uh, yeah. in, in, in the span of your career, have you seen um, these changes that uh, both either alarm you or give you hope or accommodate? Like, yes. What, what have you seen and over yes. the course of your career? And yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I had a feeling that's what happened. So, like, what's what's okay? Let's let's start with let's go with we'll we'll go from bad to good. How's that? So sure. what is worse than like today that that you're seeing in the ocean than you saw when you first started in your career? Coral reefs are dying. And, and why that, is that important? I've heard this said many, many times, 75, 80% yeah. of the coral reefs. Again, back to yep. Joe Sixpack. Why why is that a bad thing? It's a bad thing on multiple uh, levels. One which is maybe seemingly trivial but is not trivial. There absolutely jaw-droppingly gorgeous yeah Got and it. losing that in the world just makes the world a little less rich of a place right that's fair and that's important but the flip side of that is coral reefs are uh, incredible engines of productivity and right. they are producing protein that people around the world eat we don't have coral reefs off our coast so for us personally we're not actually experiencing that so much but in the tropical regions People are experiencing that in a very big way. Those reefs are no longer as productive. They're producing less fish, right. and people are having less food because of that. Wow. It's really direct. Yeah. Okay, so, I, okay, so I'm going to ask you what was better, but before I ask you what's better, how do we fix that problem? Is there things that we, because now we understand that these things are happening, what are some of the things that we can do to sort of, uh, and is that part of your studying, to figure out like what is it that we can introduce into the ocean or stop putting into the ocean, or what is it that we can do to reverse that negative trend. 
So that one that I put my finger on, that's something that we in our work are not directly uh, addressing. Sure. That one is a function of large-scale global climate change, and that comes down to CO2, carbon, sure. all those things that we've heard about so right. much. Having said that, there are people working on trying to look at coral genetics and look at which corals at, that are out in the reef today that are managing to survive have special traits and special genetic uh, characteristics that allow them to survive and are trying to work on moving those to places where they will be able to survive and reproduce better. So essentially, right. artificially gardening coral reefs back right. into existence. Right. We have a colleague um, at uh, USC who works on that named Carly Kenkel. Huh. And her work is related to that. Um, so there is some exciting work being done on that, but that is reactive work to the major problem, which is the global carbon budget. Right, right. Okay, so that was the bad news. What's That's the I news? get to do the you good news. You get to do the good news. Yeah. <laughs> what's what's so, better? I, I grew up, I, my family moved to the Palos Verdes Peninsula just as I started high school. Mm -hmm. So it's not quite dating me, but a little bit. Where did and you move from? From the San Gabriel Valley. Okay. And there were no pelicans, virtually no shorebirds at all. We had several massive oil spills happening, and we had DDT pollution that was so significant that the thinning of eggshells in pelicans and other seabirds was so significant that those animals were not reproducing and the populations had completely fallen. Right. And in my lifetime, I get to enjoy watching pelicans take the updraft every night and head back to their nesting grounds on the other sides of the port. And when I point that out to students, they kind of look at me bewildered, and I said, well, pelicans were rare. Pelicans did not exist. Another example is abalone. I am too young to have known abalone to occur, but we are now finding abalone reappearing because of the management issues and the efforts of folks trying to understand how they reproduce, how you would have to transplant them and reintroduce them in the wild. And we do see them in the wild, and we see them in, in heavily used um, uh, public access areas. Which so is from the time important. when you started your career to now, you at the beginning of your career, you wouldn't have really seen abalone. You would have now never seen an abalone. See you now can see abalone. And, that, and is that something that we did right? Or did just over time, like how did that happen? That one, was, that one has been seriously managed and studied. And again, certain species have been reared in, la in uh, aquaria and laboratories in order to be reintroduced but we needed to understand the biology of those organisms, sure. that they needed to have certain densities. Right. Otherwise, mating was not going to happen and they weren't going to be able to reproduce. Right. We've also uh, heavily tried protecting them. They're completely protected. Um, Does it get to a point maybe sometime in the future, near or far, where there's such an abundance of abalone that we can start eating abalone again? Mm -hmm. Abalone yep. is being commercially farmed for eating. Right. Again, with the climate and the water's changing and these are animals that are grazers so like little cows they need to be eating algae if the algae is not going to survive and temperature change right. the abalone we'll will not yeah. cover the beaches as we've seen the photos right. uh, of days gone by and so sort of back to your bio blitz and what you guys are doing um with you know discovering these things tracking it creating a database then scientists can come in and say oh we have this thing and we see that there's this uh this um, organism that used to be in the ocean that's now maybe still there but not as big of numbers as there used to be and we need to reintroduce that otherwise that area could start becoming um there could be less fish there could be less mussels there could be less things that we humans need to survive because we're going to be counting on that protein to survive. Would that, am I correct in that? Yeah, ultimately that's what, that's what gets us up in the morning, is trying to make it possible for people to better manage the ocean. Um, right. And I don't want to make it sound like we work for a management agency, right. but we want to provide the tools and the data and the information that allows for informed management of the marine environment. Rather than best effort, best guess, yeah. how about not guess? How right. about based no, on I'm data? Would it be kind of analogous to like a farmer who when you, you shift soils so that your farming is better, more efficient, so now you've learned what you should and shouldn't do, you're going to get better crops, you're going to have healthier crops, and you're not going to over farm a certain area, and it, it, would that be a fair analogy? I'm it's, just making this up no, as I go, no, by the way. No. <laughs> it's more than analogous. It's on target. Right. Um, 
in, and in fact, we're working with colleagues at USC who are trying to bring the kind of breeding that's happened for thousands of years in agriculture. We're totally used to the idea of breeding corn and wheat and, and crops. Right. When we uh, do f uh, farming of marine species offshore, there is almost no breeding that happens. These are basically wild caught uh, spat or wild caught organisms when you're doing things like mussel farming or oyster farming and things like that. We're in what a colleague of ours has called the pre-agricultural stage right. uh, in ocean farming. Yeah. So yeah, we are totally trying to move that forward to a point where we're doing it in an as informed a way that we now farm the land, Absolutely. which as we know has been spectacularly successful. We're actually really good at it. Right, right. Makes a lot of sense. Now, from what I understand that when you guys do this BioBlitz, um, the public's going to be able to come watch. Am I right about that? Yes, That's indeed. Correct. Now, how are they going to be able to do that? How are they going to just be able to come stand on the dock with binoculars, or what are what are they? How are they going to actually be able to watch you doing what you do? We're working with colleagues through our public uh, programs and education programs, and all of the associated institutions: the Cabrillo Aquarium, the Aquarium of the Pacific, the California Science Center, among others, to develop access such that the public can have engagement as the scientists are doing their work, as boats and ships and divers are coming and going and the, the basic work of this inventorying is happening, that there'll be opportunity for interaction, engagement, stand by and watch. Um, and I've, I've turned that over to have some of my colleagues help with that effort. Yeah. You can't do it all. You can't, can't do you it can't all. You can't do the marketing. You know, okay, now I'm going to go do my social media at night to get people to come watch us do this. Yeah, there's the sleep thing at some point. <laughs> sleep thing. I keep forgetting that. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. So the public will be yes. able to come down and watch Absolutely. If they, if they yes. want to do that, is there a way, will they be able to go to a website or how will they be able to figure out how they can come and participate and, and, and yeah. engage and watch? There are a number of ways. Um, as Regina said, we're working with a number of partners uh, that people are familiar with. Cabrillo Marine Aquarium, Aquarium of the Pacific, California Science Center, and others. Um, so they will certainly be doing um, a release of information about how and when to get involved. Uh, the Natural History Museum, our own institution, um, will do that as well. Um, we have a, a website that we use for our research group, and we'll certainly make that information available there. And that's uh, research.nhm.org. Um, and uh, that's the information will definitely be there as we are able to put it together. The basic dates that we know of are it will be August 19th through September 2. So right. that's the time window um, in which there will be we'll be working and the public will be able to be involved. And if I was going to bring my kids down or, if, or you know, anyway, would I, what, what, what are some of the primers? Like, what should I be telling my kids? Hey, we're going to do this thing. What should they be looking for? What should they be kind of get them to get them curious about what you guys are doing? Is there anything that you would point out that they might want to consider? So as scientists, you would think would be terribly organized, but we don't know what we're going to find yet. So some of it's going to be spontaneous, spur awesome. of the moment. So it is exploratory, and it's going to be the full grade of pure science that's completely novel and unknown to us. And I'm expecting to see things and find things that, you know, there's going to be 30 professional taxonomists cannot identify. Wow. And it's going to be layered with involvement from undergraduate students, graduate students, and postdocs, all the way to the five-year-old or three-year-old that is going to be able to look at a sea star and right. watch its little tube feet move. So it's going to have all of those aspects, and we're trying to integrate those and make for a really exciting and dynamic and spontaneous. It's That's awesome. going to be based on opportunity and what luck brings us. That's awesome. I, you know what I love about that is one of the things we're really trying to do here at all to see is make science accessible to the public, <laughs> make it so that it's not yeah. just... Uh, something that uh, people in academia can participate in. But again, you mentioned the five-year-old. People can come down, learn, educate, get educated. It makes them informed so they don't ask, you know, Joe six-pack questions like I just did. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think it also hopefully um, uh, motivates the next generation to do this work that's so important. So thank you very much. This is great. I'm so excited. I'm going to bring my kids to the BioBlitz. I can't wait. Excellent. We're so looking forward to <laughs> it. Love to see you there. Awesome. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you for listening to Ocean Solutions, produced by Altacy at the Port of Los Angeles. To learn more about Altacy, please visit altacy.org.